Well, greetings, Series 6 uh, test takers. This is Dean Tenney. I'm coming to you from my studio in fabulous Las Vegas. Uh, the best free supplement to your paid study materials is this YouTube channel. Uh, you're in the Series 6 playlist. Uh, when you're done and get this testing victory underway, check out the 63 playlist. When you get that testing victory, some of you will be taking a 65, and you can check out the, the videos we have in that playlist. In terms of a paid supplement, uh, I highly recommend the Kaplan QBank and the Kaplan Quick Sheets. Quick Sheets are uh, kind of a professional laminated version of a, a data dump sheet. Those are about $19. You get 10% off that with my Guru 10 discount code at checkout. And uh, the QBank, I think you can get, I think, something like 60 bucks with the Guru 10 uh, discount code at uh, checkout. There's the Kaplan commercial. A uh, shout out to Kaplan. Uh, for the commercial, they allow me to give uh, people like you a free look at Kaplan content. So what we're adding to the channel today in the Series 6 playlist is a uh, practice final. Uh, there's already one there from uh, Test Geek. Uh, shout out to Test Geek. Same deal. Uh, Brian Lee, the Test Geek himself, Test Geek Exam Prep LLC. And I thought we'd add a uh, Kaplan uh, practice final for you. What I suggest you do is uh, hit the pause button, uh, choose your answer. So you can score it up and, you know, take an intellectual inventory where you're at. All right. So uh, let's get started. Which of the following is classified as an independently prepared reprint? An independently prepared reprint. Uh, I'm going to say market letter. No, we're looking for like an article on something. An article on investing produced by the member firm. No, that wouldn't be independent. That's you writing an article. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not independent. The idea here is you might uh, not be as uh, arm's length as per perhaps you might otherwise be. Yeah, the Wall Street Journal publishes n nice things. Uh, sometimes I, when I was a practitioner, I'd like to send those to my clients and say, hey, I thought you'd think find this of interest. This is something we ought to know, something like that. I still do that in social media. I'm going to choose a C for that one. We'll see how we do when we, you know, when we get done. A customer would like to know which of the uh, following mutual funds has the highest potential for capital growth. You know, the two ways you make investment is either through income stream and or price appreciation. And so here it says we're more interested in price appreciation than we are anything else. A uh, blue chip growth stock, the blue chip is the most expensive uh, poker chip, right? Blue chip. A blue chip uh, stock is a company that has a proven track record in good times and bad. Key point, good times and bad. It's very unlikely that a blue chip stock is going to uh, have as much risk, risk and reward as other ones. So I don't like the blue chip growth stock. You should have been able to toss out the preferred stock because preferred stock and a preferred stock fund owns preferred stock as a fixed income investment vehicle. You should be able to toss out a long-term bond fund. So we have a 50-50 here because uh, B and D are definitely out. Uh, I think we should go for the small cap technology stock uh, potential for capital growth. Now, that's pretty aggressive, by the way, as, as mutual funds go. So, you know, we'd want to pair that with time horizon and suitability. But I'm going to go for the small cap stock. Okay, let's see what our next one is. Now, last time I did this, I'm trying to make it large enough you can see on your screen. And last time I did this, I didn't score it correctly. And so we didn't know how we did. So hopefully I'll do a little better on this one. Uh, before opening an account, before opening a securities account. Uh, which of the following information must be obtained to satisfy the Department of Treasury requirements, the Department of Treasury requirements? to impede money laundering. You should definitely have an understanding. By the way, you should have also had this uh, from your SIE exam as well, right? The stages of money laundering. Uh, you should know the first stage of money laundering is placement. That's the easiest way to intervene. Layering, I mix my dirty money with my clean money. Integration, you can't tell my dirty money from my clean money. So let's see what our choices are here. Uh, I need a customer name, address, tax seed, a tax seed on a number, cash or margin. No, cash or margin isn't, you know, generic to answering this question, right? So 
By the way, if any part of the question is wrong, then you know that makes the whole answer set. So let's see what our other choices are. Uh, asset allocation, percentage ownership of a public company, 10%. No, I mean, that's something to know, but that's not necessarily you know, uh, related to money laundering. Uh, customer name, address, social security number. I'll take that. Date of birth. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, date of birth is important under what we call the customer identification procedure, CIP. So I'm going to say that uh, given this answer set, that is the uh, best answer. And like I'll say, we'll see how we do when we get done. All right, number four. Under RISA, RISA stands for Every Ridiculous Idea Since Adam. No, RISA stands for the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, passed in 1974. You know, there were two major crises in the pension plan arena. You know, the Teamsters kept lending their pension money to the mob. We didn't think that was a good idea. And uh, uh, Studebaker had a defined benefit plant that went under. So as a result of those two, Congress passed the Employee Retirement Income Security Act for vesting eligibility and funding except. So, you know, we call these qualified plans because you're using pre-tax money. And when you're using pre-tax money, money you've never paid taxes on, you've got to meet the qualifications of ERISA, the Department of Labor, the IRS. If you don't meet those qualifications, well, then we call it a non-qualified retirement plan. So let's see, uh, you know, who doesn't have to meet this thing? Uh, a Keo plan certainly does. Keo plans are subject to ERISA. Senator Keo is no longer with us, but if you're a senator and you come up with the idea, we name it after you like Senator Keo, Senator Roth, Roth Ira, that kind of thing. A deferred compensation plan. No, no deferred comp, you're not using pre-tax money. You haven't met the qualifications. In fact, we refer to deferred comp as a non-qualified retirement plan because you're funding it with after tax. Corporate pension plan, absolutely. And that'd either be defined benefit or defined contribution. Profit sharing plans, absolutely. I'm pretty sure we got that one right. Uh, question five. Again, there is some overlap. We're hoping that this, some of this stuff looks familiar from your uh, SIE. Okay, Albert, an accredited investor. You should definitely know that an accredited investor is somebody with a million dollars net worth that's exclusive of their primary residence or $200,000 in annual income with the expectation of $200,000 this year or married in filing jointly, $300,000 for the last two years with the expectation of that this year. Good news for you. If you are going on to your 65 and you're in good standing with an investment advisory firm, you too will be an accredited investor. And the main thing about being an accredited investor is you can participate in private placements, Reg D private placements. So invest $100,000 in a hedge fund. Hedge funds are organized as private partnerships. The whole point of a hedge fund is not to be a mutual fund, not to have to comply with the Investment Company Act of 1940. That was the first guy who set up a hedge fund. That was his express purpose. So these are organized as uh, partnerships. His investment is now valued at 110000 Not very impressive for a hedge fund, but oh well. An unfortunate set of circumstances require him to sell his shares immediately. Well, the problem with being in a partnership, the hedge fund manager, the general partner, and use the investor or the uh, limited partner, is you can't get in or out of a, a partnership without the GP, the general partner's permission. So he needs to turn his cash into, uh, turn his investment into cash uh, quickly. This results in interest rate risk, eh, reinvestment risk, eh, market risk, eh, ding, 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 ding. Yeah, it might be a reason you would not want to be in a hedge fund but rather a mutual fund, right? Mutual fund, you got guaranteed a marketability at the NAV. I'm going to say D. I feel pretty good about that answer. Uh, which of the following is listed on a uh, balance sheet? Uh, I'm thinking about doing a whole separate lecture on balance sheets, and I'm just not sure if I did it, you know, how many playlists I would put it in, because on some of your exams, it's uh, more important than other uh, exams. So which of the following would be listed as an asset on the company's balance sheet? You know, the classical balance sheet equation is assets minus liabilities equals net worth. And accounts payable, no. Accounts payable is what we owe others. That's a liability. Accounts receivable would be an asset, but accounts payable are a current liability. Uh, fixed assets, that sounds pretty good. 
Asset side, yeah, with the balance sheet. That sounds good. Current liabilities, no. Invested capital, I don't even know what that is. Uh, fixed assets. All the following are tip typically found operating in the secondary market, except. Uh, I think you should be able to make this distinction between the primary market and the secondary market. Primary transactions are where the issuer receives the proceeds. And all those transactions together are called the primary market. You know, secondary market is where the previous owner, or I should say secondary transactions, the previous owner is receiving the proceeds. And all those together are the secondary market. So when we form underwriting syndicates, when we form underwriting syndicates, we're doing so to raise money for an issuer. Third market dealers. Now, third market are listed securities traded over the counter. And third market dealers are the ones who, uh, you know, provide liquidity by, you know, uh, buying at the bid and selling at the ask. Market, market makers, secondary transactions. Uh, exchanges are secondary transactions. And they're asking me accept. So we're going to go for the syndicate on that one. Remember, the mutual fund will be participating in both. You know, your open-end mutual fund will be participating in uh, both the primary and the secondary market. I mean, a fund manager may be buying, you know, used, he may be buying new, right? Under the Investment Company Act of 1940, uh, an investment company may take all the following forms except. So, you know, you have to define yourself uh, under the act. And you can define yourself as an open-end investment company. That shouldn't be throwing you for a loop. That's the one we know and love where we're continually offering new shares to the public. So we have to comply with not only 1940, but we also are going to have to comply uh, with 33. A limited partnership. A limited partnership is not a mutual fund. You know, a limited partnership has the flow through. Closed-end fund, yeah, trade supply and demand. A unit investment trust, yeah, fixed portfolio of professionally selected assets with passive management. So it looks like B is not going to be a mutual fund. Your customer would like to know what advantages mutual funds have over other types of investments. Well, there's a lot of uh, advantages of a mutual fund. I think of a mutual fund as providing with professional management, diversification, ease of ownership. You know, uh, I always joke when I'm teaching Series 7 class, I say, you know, if you uh, want to turn on your manager when you get your seven, say, I know I have a series seven, but it's okay if I just sell mutual funds. Most of your managers would say that would be wonderful. <laughs> right? So uh, let's look at it. You would like to know what advantages mutual funds enjoy other types of investments. In addressing the customer's question, you might make which of the following statements. I'm trying to make it uh, big so you guys can... Uh, see it if you're on your mobile phone. I'm trying to do as best as I can on that, but looks like I've got so big, we can't see all of our answer sets. You know, I always say RTFQ, read the full question. Also read the full answer set. Since we can't see the entire answer set in its entirety, we'll just go through it one by one. All right, so your customer would like to know what advantages mutual funds enjoy over other types of investments. In addressing the customer's question, you might say, uh, take make which of the following statements. Because you always get a precise, precise fraction of the mutual fund when you redeem, you can at least be sure you won't suffer any losses. Absolutely not. If you said A, oh my goodness, remember you're hitting the pause button and you're seeing how you did. I, you know, you, it's only a miss of one point, but if I were in charge, man, I would take off 10 points. I mean, that's just a really bad answer. The cost of investing in mutual funds is lower than any other investment. No, you can't make unfair comparisons. That's not necessarily true. Uh, mutual funds have tax advantages. No, they do not. You know, mutual funds actually are at a tax disadvantage because, you know, the capital gains tax is a transaction-based tax. But when you own individual securities, you would decide when to sell your securities and realize that. But in a mutual fund, that's not up to you. That's up to the fund manager. So that's absolutely not true. Uh, then it says, uh, compared to an annuity or life insurance with high returns. Ugh. It looks like there we go. You know, professional management, diversification, and ease of ownership ease of ownership. Uh, T-bills are direct obligations of the U.S. Treasury, uh, U.S. government, and are issued at par. Eh. 
Now, all money market securities, including T-bills, are issued at a discount. So that is not true. Uh, they trade in the secondary market. That is true. They are redeemable. Well, you know, they're going to get the the amount back when it's time. But we definitely know that we need two and four. I'm not sure what they mean by redeemable because you're just going to hold them uh, to maturity. And that's going to be what you get when you do that. So let's uh, check out our answer set. I know I need something without one. And I know I need two and four. So let's see what uh, answers are available to us. I don't, I'm, redeemable is associated with an open and mutual fund. So I'm going for two and four if it's available to me. Let's see what we got. Yeah, I don't have to burn up brain cells because I know I need two and four. So going for that. An investor has 250000 to invest in mutual funds. Which of the following would be appropriate statements, appropriate statements to make to him? So, you know, there's a lot of this is like, what can you say and what can't you say when selling investments? You know, ours is the only ind industry I really know of that is like that. You know, most industries, it's let the buyer beware. But our industry, it's let the seller beware. So an investor has $250,000 to invest in mutual funds, which of the following would be appropriate statements to make to him. Uh, buying a no-load fund will ensure better performance in the long run. Well, listen, what, you have a crystal ball? How do you know anything about the long run? I mean, we should be able to say in our sleep that past performance is not indicative of future results. You know, they have a lower expense structure, but that's not about performance. So we need something without one. Uh, two, if you purchase class B shares, you will have a no load now. Will you probably incur higher operating costs? That's indeed true. Remember, because class B shares have a contingent deferred sales charge. And they typically have a higher, uh, you know, uh, expense until that uh, you've been in the fund X number of uh, years, whatever the case may be. So that's true. Uh, a purchase of Class A shares in this quantity would probably lead to a reduction in break in uh, sales charge. It's called a break point. Yeah, I would imagine that sounds pretty reasonable to me. Uh, I started out uh, decades ago as a retail stockbroker and ended up as an institutional. But when I was selling uh, mutual funds to the uh, investing public. Uh, the first break points on the funds I did business with was a hundred thousand bucks. So uh, I'm going to say, we can't say one, we can say two and three. So let's go for that. Uh, by the way, all the test prep vendors, including Kaplan go overboard on multiples. You will not see any multiple on a FINRA exam. You know, we'll, you only see multiples on NASA exams. So when you come for your 63, 65, uh, that's when you will see uh, those kind of formats. Okay, so Alpha Securities acts as a dealer. So a dealer is a broker dealer. We're all called broker dealers, but this means I buy securities into my inventory at my bid and I sell inventory uh, securities out of my inventory at my ask. So, you know, if the customer is purchasing, they're paying my asking price, my ask or offer price, and that's going to be my mark up. So when I customer buys, the customer is paying a mark up and the customer sells, they're paying a mark down. Um, I think a good analogy is a car dealer, right? A car dealer, when he sells vehicles, has a mark up when you buy the car. When you trade it in, you get a mark down. So I'm going to say A on that one. Uh, which of the following entities does not issue municipal bonds? So on your exam, when we say municipal issuers, we mean exclusively states and counties and school districts. We don't refer to the U.S. government as a municipal issuer, right? It's a, one of a doubt. So counties, you ask Clark County, Nevada is where I'm uh, talking to you from my studio here in fabulous Las Vegas. Uh, states, Nevada, absolutely. And cities, Las Vegas, absolutely. Not the U.S. government. Remember, this is important because one of the mutual funds that we're going to offer is a tax-free municipal bond fund. You know, I used to tell all my baby brokers term of endearment that that's, if you want to go out and, you know, meet people, why not use a tax-free fund? I mean, that's, you know, hey, listen, are you interested in tax-free income? <laughs> Almost everybody would uh, say yes to that. All right, 14 of uh, 50, 139. By the way, you can always take breaks. Uh, these practice uh, simulation exams that we do together when we explicate them and we go through them usually come in at an hour or so. 
but remember you can always take a break however you're using this as a as kind of a gauge of where you're at an intellectual inventory maybe you want to try and suck it up as much as you can uh i think you can get a lot of these questions by covering up the screen are they asking about paper prospectuses 33 or are they asking about people in places 34 you know all this legislation was called the new deal it means the old deal must have sucked, right? President Roosevelt called the New Deal. And 33 says if you're going to sell brand new securities to the public, you have to make a registration statement. You know, and then 34 created the SEC. It's about people and places. Uh, well, there we go. I just gave away choice one, right? It created the SEC. It did. Under the theory that the best gameskeeper is a former poacher, uh, President Roosevelt made Joe Kennedy the first chairman of the SEC. It requires the registration of uh, broker-dealers uh, with the SEC. Yeah, you know, you're not done when you get your six. You're going to come back and take another exam. I know you're excited. It's 63 and perhaps uh, a 65 as well. And it's going to be a huge part of that exam to know about registrations with both uh, the SEC, FINRA, and the state. So two is true. So one is true. Two is true. It provides for registration new issues. No, that was the Securities Act of 33 Prospectus Paper Act. It regulates the activities of investment advisors. No, that is the Investment Advisor Act of 1940. So that's going to be one and two. Uh, which of the following are cyclical industries except? So, you know, in the business cycle, uh, cyclical industries, when things are good, they're really, really good. And when they're bad, they're really, really bad. And so uh, I think it's more likely you'll get tested on defensive uh, securities rather than cyclical. But, uh, you know, automobiles are cyclical, right? You can delay purchasing an automobile. You don't buy a new car unless you're feeling pretty good about, uh, you know, the economy. You can delay purchasing a new refrigerator, washer, or dryer. You can delay purchasing heavy equipment. So again, these are products and services. Uh, you know, that can be delayed. Precious metals are not uh, considered cyclical industries. Precious metals are, metals are their own kind of a category. So I don't really like this answer set, but I'm going to say precious metals. Uh, I use what I call my Sesame Street. One of these things is not like the other. And that seems like the one that's out of there, right? Precious metal. By the way, it doesn't say mining stocks. It says precious metals. So I'm going to go for A. You know, a lot of people would think precious metals are what we call counter, counter cyclical. Uh, which of the following are not considered uh, public communications of a broker dealer? Boy, you know, there are three buckets. You don't care on your exam about uh, institutional communications of a broker dealer. Uh, but as a test taker, you definitely do care about the two remaining buckets, which are retail communications. Uh, retail communications is really important and correspondence about where they're going to be, you know, approved. So here they're telling us that three of these things are considered public communications. One of them uh, is not, you know, you have to file your retail communications with FINRA either 10 days prior to first use, if you're a new firm, or if it's a particular type of advertisement or communication, retail communication, 10 days after first use, if you're an established firm. And so one of these things is not like that, and that's going to be uh, prospectuses. Now, these things are going to twenty-five, uh, more than 25 in a 30-day period, retail customers, and therefore, or retail communication. The other question about retail communication is that it has to be approved by a principal pre-distribution. So uh, you will, that's high risk, uh, those definitions. Correspondence is 25 or fewer in a 30-day period. And there, your principal can approve it pre or post uh, distribution. Uh, 12B1 fees may be uh, used. 12B1 fees are promotional expenses uh, paid by the mutual fund. Promotional expenses. You're not associated with managing the money. Not associated with managing the money. So printing prospectuses, that sounds like a promotional expense to me. Advertising costs sounds like a promotional expense to me. Uh, mailing expenses sounds like a promotional expense to me. D, no, that's not a promotional expense. That's something that's paid by the fund, not to promote the fund, but just as a part of the ongoing business of buying and selling 
uh, the securities. So uh, 12B1 fees, I would know, are promotional expenses. You'll get a question like this. Not a big fan of this question, but you know the investment advisory fee is not a promotional expense. So you'll get this. I call these Sesame Street tricks. One of these things is not like the other, right? Um, I would know that uh, most a no-load mutual fund can charge as one quarter of 1%, 25 basis points, 25 bips, one quarter of uh, 1%. Over the life of a fund, I would know. By the way, if you go past that, you can go past one quarter of 1% as a promotional expense, but then you can't refer to your fund as no load. Uh, the most over the life would be three quarters of uh, 1%. Which of the following is be found in a final prospectus, but not the preliminary prospectus? So they're asking us to distinguish here between the statutory full-blown final prospectus and the preliminary, but not the preliminary. Uh, the company history, yes. Company financials, yes. Yeah, you're going to make your registration uh, statement with the SEC. Once you make that registration statement, you enter into what's called the cooling off period or quiet time, which is a minimum of 20 days. And you're going to be using the preliminary prospectus known as the red herring. And it has pretty much everything you need in there. Uh, it has the balance sheet, the income statement, a planned use of the funds, but it doesn't have the effective date because we don't know when we're going to make make it through this process, right? So who knows? We may never make it out of the, the cooling off period or quiet time. There has been issuers that have gone in there and never made it out the other end to the effective date. The effective date is when now we have this uh, security. And if you miss the IPO allocation, maybe you can uh, pick it up in the uh, secondary market. So, you know, we don't know that. That's, you know, that depends on how quick we get through the process. Um, please uh, note, uh, we, based on that, we can take indications of interest, which are non-binding on all parties, and we can place a tombstone. Uh, you know, we're not allowed to advertise a new issue, but the tombstone is not considered an advertisement. Uh, by the way, the questions have are numbered, right? So if you, you know, want to, you have a question, uh, I'll timestamp this. Sometimes I run a little late on timestamping things, but you know, if you say, Dean, I'm taking the Series 6 uh, practice final with you at question 19, that's helpful. So I know what you're looking at. But you can also just give me the QID number. So if you have one you want to talk about, you can do that. Uh, it looks like I got about the right size for these types of questions. Uh, like I say, try and blow it up a little bit so you can, as best possible, you can see this if you're not watching on a 27-inch screen like I am. So I've done surveys in about half of our users at our channel are using um, mobile devices. So uh, which of the following types of mutual funds most likely have a capital appreciation as a stated objective? Well, I think we should toss out the muni bond fund and the income fund right out, right? So B and D are out. A balance fund is going to have stocks and bonds. The only one that's going to have uh, stocks exclusively would be the specialty fund. So I'm going to go for the specialty fund. Rank the following from least to most capital risk, from least to most. Wow. You know, these ones are kind of exciting. So, you know, what I what I sometimes like to do on these is try and figure out, can I pick one that I'm going to put on the either end? So from least to most. So I'm going to shop my answer set here and think I want treasury bills uh, first. I should know the treasury bills are considered the risk-free rate of return. So I know I want two, and then Ginny Mays have the full faith and credit of the United States government. So you should know that, by the way. You should know Ginny Mays pay interest in principal monthly. They're fully taxable, and they have full faith and credit. Uh, but Ginny Mays do have interest rate risk. If interest rates go down, people refinance the mortgages. Interest rates go up, they don't. So there's no credit risk in a Ginny Mae, but there certainly is interest rate risk. T-bills, because they're short-term, have neither credit nor interest rate risk. And that's why we refer to the uh, risk-free rate of return. Uh, let's see. Then I got a zero coupon bond, which is a debt instrument. And then I got equity. So I think I'm looking for two, one, four, three. Two, one, four, three. Two, one, four, three. Now, be careful. I, I can't tell you how many times I'll say the right thing and I'll click the wrong button. So I said I want two, one, four, three. So D. A bond trades at a nominal yield of 98. So you should know that that's 98% of par. So I'll just get out my thing here, 98% of par. 
you should definitely know that par is a thousand. So you should be able to know that that's 980. And you should definitely know that current yield is what an investment pays you divided by what it costs you. So we're going to take 1,000 times 8% to figure out what it pays us in annual interest. And what it pays us in annual interest is $80. That'll be paid to me in two semi-annual installments. And current yield is what an investment pays you divided by what it costs you. And so let me get on my calculator. I'm going to use a my calculator. I'm terrible at arithmetic, so I'm not being facetious. I'm going to use my calculator. And I get uh, 8.16. There we go. Cool. So, you know, I'm not a big fan of math. People either love math or hate math. Uh, I'm not a big fan of math, but you got to embrace it on your exam because with math, there's no interpretation of the right answer. I mean, you simply uh, get it right or you get it wrong, right? The three styles of questions you get are recognition, uh, practical application. This is practical application and, um, and uh, judgment. You're not going to get too much judgment on the, on this exam, but you should be prepared to do a uh, current yield. You should be prepared to do current yield. Okay. Boom. A broker's dealer's website is what type of communication? So remember I said there's three buckets of communication. Uh, the buckets are institutional. We don't really care about that bucket. Uh, we said uh, uh, retail communication, which we do care about. And we said correspondence, right? So uh, it looks like, remember, retail communication looks like to me because it's going to uh, more than 25. So I'm going to say retail communication. Uh, I can't imagine where institutional communication would be the right answer on a series six you know, because you're selling mutual funds to the public. Uh, correspondence might certainly be the answer. Uh, research reports are considered sales literature. So don't fall for a trick or retail communication. Uh, it doesn't matter who I send the research report to. It's still retail communication. So I'll go for B on that one. Aaron has a stated objective of safety and liquidity. What is the least suitable recommendation? Do you know there's a lot less consensus on what would be suitable given somebody's investment objective, but there's a lot more consensus on what would clearly be unsuitable given somebody's uh, an investment objective. You know, exchange traded funds trade in the secondary market. Uh, that means they can be turned back into money quickly. Common stock trades in the secondary market can be turned back into money quickly. A class A mutual fund can be redeemed within seven calendar days of them receiving the redemption request at the next calculation of an AV. As we said earlier, you can't get in or out of a partnership without the general partner's permission. And so, uh, A, you should definitely know partnerships have a lack of liquidity. So not going to be suitable for somebody who needs that. Uh, how often must a member firm uh, provide a copy of its procedures? This is kind of weird language procedures of the broker dealer uh, to the customer. You know, I think you're more likely to see how often uh, must we provide statements, which is quarterly, you know, would be the minimum and monthly if it's a penny stock in the account. But it's not about a, a statement. It's about our procedures. And so I think that's uh, not really fixed. I think we're just looking for upon customer crust, right? But, you know, sometimes we it's our procedures need to be in written form. We need to have written supervisory procedures. So, you know, the customer doesn't think I'm arbitrarily discriminatory, making things up on the fly just for them. So, you know, we want to have written procedures. You know, sometimes we refer to these as our house requirements. So I'm going to go for D. I'm going to go for D. Whoop, I don't know what I did there. I've turned my screen into a different... Uh, a guardian, a guardian. I'll see if I can fix my screen. I uh, apologize. I don't know what I did. Oh, there we go. Maybe it'll fix itself. We'll see. Anyways, a guardian would be appointed by the court. Now, I don't know of any exam where you're not going to be asked about, uh, you know, uh, something like this. And a guardian would be appointed. So, you know, something happens like in an UPMA account to the custodian. And then the court's going to intervene. And the court would do that uh, prior to the account opening. So by definition, that's going to be C. I don't know why it's putting this blue here. Oh, there we go. Got it fixed. Uh, be careful, by the way. 
uh, that you know about UPMA's Uniform Transfer to Minors Act, Uniform Gift to Minors Act, Kids Tax ID, one minor, one custodian per account, no margin. Uh, that's definitely going to be there. Uh, Senator Roth, I told you, is no longer here to protect his Roth IRA, but Roth IRAs are pretty cool. If I were going to ask you a question, I'd ask you about legislative risk. I think these things are so cool. You know, what Congress giveth, Congress can taketh away, right? So uh, which of the following circumstances can an owner of a Roth IRA uh, take an early distribution without uh, penalty? And there are uh, waivers to take a distribution for the uh, first time uh, purchase of a home, right? So let's see, where's that? Do I have that as a choice? There we go. Boom. So, you know, sometimes if you studied hard, you're, you're looking for your answer. And maybe the phraseology is just a little different, uh, but you, uh, you know, you just got to hang with it and say, oh, I know I know the answer to this. That, what they can take is, not, I don't think you'll see it, but it's actually uh, 10 grand. Now, remember the Roth IRA may be in a mutual fund. So that's why, you know, it's fair game to test on it. Uh, Cam, Cam delivers a written complaint to the broker dealer. So written complaints must be handled by supervisors. We have to file them quarterly with FINRA. You know, you're not supposed to handle your own complaints. I'm not sure that's what this is about, but that's kind of what would be on my brain housing group. Uh, Kim delivers a written of representative's actions. After discussing the matter with the principal of the firm, Kim withdraws her complaint. Which of the following is not true regarding Great Plains responsibilities following the resolution? Now, be careful again. You know, the test will be a little better, but, you know, you got to really kind of pay attention to pivot words, right? So they're asking me, one of these things is not true. So let's go through our answer set. Let me clean up my, to my slide, boom. Uh, Great Plains must include the complaint uh, in its uh, statistic, quarterly statistic report. Yeah, we have to file our complaints quarterly with FINRA. So A is true. Uh, Great Plains must include the complaint with quarterly summary complaints. That's true. We just talked about that. Uh, complaints are indeed a four-year record. That is true. So we don't afford the SEC. The FINRA is our, our regulator, right? So D, it doesn't go to the SEC. It goes to FINRA. Uh, which of the following are exempt under the Securities Act of uh, 1933? Now, what that means in English, right, is that means they don't have to make a registration statement with the SEC to sell securities, brand new securities in the primary market, right? So uh, short-term notes with maturities of 270 days. Uh, this is a practice six final, I hope. I hope I picked the right cue bag from Kaplan. But uh, learn it once, get tested twice. This will also be on your 63 and your 65. Uh, commercial. That's called commercial paper. You know, A and B, you know, B is commercial paper. A is the definition of that. Well, it could also be banker's acceptances. But commercial paper isn't sold to retail investors. It's sold to money market, for, uh, money market fund managers who are capable of protecting their own interests, their own assets. Uh, banker's acceptances are used to facilitate foreign trade. Uh, they too are money market securities. So money market securities are exempt from registration under 33 as well as the Uniform Securities Act when you come back to take your 63, 65, all of the above, all of the above, right? So if a registered rep opens a joint account for three people, that's kind of odd. Uh, the registered rep should obtain information. Well, you know, I'm trying to do determine suitability, and there's three people involved here, so I think I want to want to determine suitability on all these. You know, we have a, what's called your know your customer rule, KYC, and so I think I'm going to want uh, information on all the tenants, right? Uh, let's see, tenant with laws down. No, no, you know, we, they're going to have, you know, we're going to have to do suitability for basically all the parties to the account. Uh, by the way, customer counts is heavily tested on your six. So, you know, a lot of people, uh, there's a lot of overlap on your SIE. That's why I hope you, you know, uh, had done all the work on your SIE and now you're seeing that it pays you dividends. Uh, but a lot of times people in the SIE think, oh, they're not going to ask me that again about joint tenants and UPMAs. And uh, they certainly are, you know, to tenants with rights survivorship. So transfer on death. So make sure you got all that stuff down.
a mutual fund has a net asset value of $7.80. Uh, we have to calculate that NAV at least once per business day. We're always doing business based on the next calculation of the NAV. That's called forward pricing. And the NAV plus the sales charge equals the public offering price. The fund pays the underwriter a concession of 12 cents. Okay, maybe we need that, maybe we don't. The fund has a sales load of 50 cents. The 50 cents is inclusive of the 12. So that 12 is already in the 50 cents, right? So, you know, I think what they're trying to bait us into thinking is this is somehow 50 plus something. No, the NAV plus the sales charge, 50 cents, equals the public offering price. That says the administrative fee is 15 cents. Again, that has nothing to do with the NAV plus the sales charge equal the public offering price. So the NAV, $9.80 plus the sales charge, 50 cents equals the public offering price. And remember the max that could be, the max that could be would be eight and a half percent. I don't know what the load is here, but I could figure it out. I could take the uh, NAV and, uh, you know, or excuse me, the uh, 50 cents and uh, divide that by the uh, NAV and find out what the public offering price is. But remember, it can't be more than eight and a half percent. Uh, FINRA rule 2210, communications with uh, the public. We said this is very, very testable, this idea of retail communications versus uh, correspondence. And uh, we said that's really uh, testable. So it says, uh, describe several. One of these categories is called, well, we said the three buckets are institutional communication, which we don't care about as a test taker. Uh, retail communication, which we do, and correspondence. So, boom. Social media goes into retail communication, public appearances. Email may be either bucket, depending on you know how many emails to whom and what time frame. Uh, which of the following is a research report? You know, where we said research reports go into that retail communication bucket. A uh, notice of a rating change? Nope. A commentary on the election's economic in, in, impact? No. Nope. An analyst report on the stock? Yeah. You know, I have to date it. I have to tell you whether we were an underwriter within the last 12 months. You know, it uh, looks like C. The rules uh, concerning a person from firm and opening an account at another firm. This is very testable. You know, so you're, you know, want to open an account somewhere else. Now, remember the house requirement can always be more stringent. I know a lot of firms that say, no way. You will keep your investments here at our firm, right? Uh, so the rules concerning a person from a FINRA member firm opening an account with another member are applicable to which of the following? The registered rep of a member, yes. So if I'm broker dealer A, I'll just say I'm Schwab. You're opening an account. You work at Fidelity. Yes, there's rules about that. So that's true. Two, the uncle, one of the officers. No, uncles aren't immediate family members. The employee of a member who's selling only government securities, that's not meaningful to the rule. If an employee of one firm, firm A, wants to open a firm with firm B, you know, then I'm going to notify your firm and I'm going to follow and make written notice to your employing firm and follow any instructions they give me. So I'm looking for one and three. Close friends, no. A registered rep with a Series 6. Hey, that's you. Or I should say that will be you after you pass your exam, right? So once you pass your exam, whoo. Uh, a registered rep with a Series 6 can sell which of the following? So you can sell mutual funds with a prospectus. You're not allowed to be able to engaging in secondary transactions. So a mutual fund that redeems its own shares, that sounds like the right answer. ETF, secondary market, REIT, secondary market on this initial public offering. No, you have what's called limited registration. A closed-end fund, be careful of a closed-end fund. If it was the IPO of a closed-end fund, you could. But remember, all you can sell is mutual funds with a prospectus, meaning mutual funds in the primary uh, market. You know, I, I hate to break the news to you, 
Uh, but you know, you're probably going to have to take a seven someday. <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> you know, I can't tell you how many people get a six because that's what their firm needed them to have. And then they were doing things and they come up with a product like an ETF and it triggers them having to go take a, a series seven. So what you can do with six is sell mutual funds with a, a prospectus. So closed end fund, the answer on the IPO is you could do that. But remember this says selling in the secondary market. Uh, what is the maximum number of accredited investors in a Reg D? A Reg D is a private placement. It's an exemption under 33. And we tell the SEC that we don't want to register the security. And we say, we're only going to sell it by invitation only. And we're only going to send it or invite accredited investors, depending on what version of this that we're using. So be careful. We can have an unlimited number of investors in a private placement. An unlimited number of accredited investors in a private placement. Now, I don't think they'll get into the uh, particulars of a 506B or a 506C. But if it's a 506B, uh, again, I can have an unlimited number of investors. Still C is the right choice, but no more than 35 are not accredited and I can't solicit it. I don't think they'll get into that on a six. If it's 506C, I can have an unlimited number of investors. None can be anything other than accredited. And, uh, you know, I can't solicit. So be careful. You know, you might have guessed D here, but it didn't ask us, what is the max of the unaccredited investors I can have in a reg D, which would be 35. It says, how many can I have, which is unlimited? So the answer is C. So be careful. As I said, it's a giant reading test, giant reading test. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I get a paragraph. You know, I told you what I sometimes like to do when I get these paragraph long questions is I like to kind of say, okay, well, uh, let me, you know, read the last sentence first uh, just to see where this ends up. Uh, which of the following securities might you suggest for the portfolio? Okay, so, and sometimes I like to read the answer set first. And sometimes I like to read it from bottom to top just to kind of, you know, so m &L, convertible bond is a choice. Investment grade, ABC, investment grade, wow, triple A. That's crazy. Uh, I only know of two corporations that have triple A credit quality. And it's Microsoft and Johnson and & Johnson. And ABC and MO are certainly on that. Um, and then I have this really oddball one. I have a uh, less than investment grade bond and equipment dress certificate. So that's kind of oddball out. And I have some common stocks. So I got two triple A bonds. I've got a Stuck common stock. I got a neat uh, equipment dress certificate. Remember that's secured by major movable equipment. All right. So uh, let's see. It's a 70 year old client. Wow. So senior, red alert, senior, $400,000, which is a sum of portfolio that will provide her with consistent, consistent cash flow for her projected life expectancy. Uh, she would like to maximize her return, but is not willing to assume a high degree of risk. Okay, so that means we can now eliminate choice A and we can eliminate choice B. So now we're gonna do these AAA credits. And it says that she's uh, after income, consistent cash flow. Now the convertible bond isn't gonna pay as much because of the conversion feature. It'll have a lower yield. And you know, again, then you'd have to convert and maybe the conversion feature doesn't make sense. So given that answer set, and based on her profile, I think I'm going to go for the AAA ABC Corporation debenture. Oh, man, these things are getting long, right? So these paragraph ones, as I told you, can be a real reading challenge, a reading challenge. All right, so uh, let's look at this one. An investor sells EGH common stock that she has owned for six months at a loss of $2,500 on February 16th. Okay, so, you know, she's got a loss. Two weeks later, she purchases preemptive rights. She establishes the choice to buy the stock at a uh, price of $1.50. Exercisable at a price of $35. Which of all best describes the tax treatment of this transaction as well? You know, the IRS uh, thinks that when I sell an investment for a loss, and I buy it back within 30 days, that I'm really not through with it as an investment. And what I'm really trying to do is just take that on my uh, loss, on my tax return and reestablish it, meaning I'm not quite done with an, an investment. 
And it sounds like to me, the date here kind of hints to me, I think this is going to be a 30 day wash sale situation, right? So two weeks later. So uh, remember, if we want to reestablish that position at a lower cost, we're going to have to wait at least 30 days. So let's see what our choices are. The purchase of the rights, according to IRS rules, represents the reestablishment. Yeah, so when you're trying to get clever and rights or sell a put or do a convertible, anything that gets you back in the security is going to be a problem. Substantially identical and will be disallowed. Yeah, wash sale within 30 days. So uh, I like that one. Let me just see if there's not something I like better. Purchase of the rights reduces? No. Purchase of the rights? No. The purchase of the rights increases? No. So yeah, it looks like our best choice on that one. Uh, FINRA may take uh, which of the following ac actions uh, against a member firm? Uh, you know, FINRA does not have a badge and a gun. You know, FINRA has told me that their number one violation is people not cooperating with them. And uh, I can kind of understand that because, you know, cooperation with FINRA might lead to bigger problems, right? <laughs> so I had a weird person on the 24 sent me a, a question. And I, I didn't understand the question because they were saying if FINRA requests information for some, I, you know, some people can lock on the wrong answers. And I said, FINRA doesn't do that. That just is not, you know, the mission of FINRA. So they wouldn't be involved in such a scenario, right? So two, uh, two they can certainly do. Censure is written disapproval of your conduct. And they can certainly suspend you, but they can't throw you in prison. They can't indict you. That would be a court of law. So it's two and four. Two and four. All the following information would be helpful to uh, do our customer profile. Remember, we said our customer profile is really important in determining suitability and in terms of knowing my customer. You know, the way I used to do it when I was a practitioner is say, listen, for me to do a really good job for you over time, I need to know a lot about you. And the more I know about you, the better I can do in determining suitability. Can you tell me a little bit about your financial uh, status? You know, why don't we just do a personal balance sheet and see what you owe, owe and what you own? So yeah, mortgage balance would be really important. Uh, how much uh, the educational achievement, you know, I mean, you know, the customer might want to chat that up, but I mean, you know, listen, I've known some people that don't have a bachelor's degree. They're very smart and very rich. That really has nothing to do with suitability. Maybe we document that, but you know, that's, that's not, you know, part of the process. Uh, I would use Sesame Street here. One of these things is not like the other. The amount of life insurance you own is important and your previous investment experience. So given that answer set, I'm going to say that B is the odd man out. An investor purchased a variable annuity. I think of a variable annuity as a mutual fund with an insurance wrapper, a mutual fund with an insurance wrapper. And that means you have to be licensed to sell both uh, securities and uh, life insurance. So variable annuities. We also refer to variable annuities as non-qualified retirement plans. Non-qualified retirement plans because you're using after-tax money to uh, fund those. Uh, he has encountered financial difficulties and asked his registered rep if he can arrange to delay his next few payments. The registered rep explains that uh, you cannot meet, you should not have invested in the first, well, oh, that just makes no sense. We don't tell him, hey, you can't meet your commitments and why'd you invest? <laughs> no. uh, the customer should exchange his annuity for a variable life insurance contract. I'm not sure how that would you know help the problem he's got. If he starts missing his payments, there will be penalties. The customer may pay in as much as little as frequently and infrequently as pleased with no penalty. Yeah. Right. So here he's saying, can he delay his next few payments? Certainly. You know, a variable annuity, it's not mandatory. You put in the money. So the answer is D. I would expect to get a couple of questions on variable annuity. So make sure you know that 59 and a half is when you can either, you know, take a lump sum or random uh, distribution. Uh, random distributions would be done uh, LIFO, last in, first out. Uh, I would know if you annuitize and choose life only, it's the largest monthly payment. So uh, make sure you, you're comfortable with uh, you know the three or four questions you might encounter on a variable annuity. Uh, an investor rep tells his client, because the investment has made a 5% return for the last 20 years, I, oh my goodness, you should definitely know. You can't, listen, nobody has a crystal ball. You're supposed to be able to stay in your sleep. 
past performance is not indicative of future results, right? So an acceptable statement, no. A minor rule in faction, no. Uh, no, it's a violation of the conduct rules. The code of conduct is the ethical behavior that associated persons, agents, broker dealers, you, and broker dealers, the firm, owes customers. And making any kind of a, 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 a comment about future performance is a big, big no-no, right? All our hypothetical illustrations are about what would have happened in the past. And you say, well, Dean, I don't know what my money looks like 10 years ago had I invested in the fund. I want to know what it looks like 10 years from today. And I said, well, I don't know what to tell you. If interest rates are dropping with a maturing bond, uh, with a maturing bond, we'll be most concerned with so, you know, if anybody ever asks you about economics, finance, or investments, and you want to sound smart, you should say it has a lot to do with interest rates. And if you just shut up, you sound good. And people say, what about them? You say they fluctuate. Is that good news or bad news? You say it depends. Can you tell me more? So if interest rates are dropping, what I'm afraid about is I'm going to have to reinvest my bond that's maturing at today's lower rate. And so that's called reinvestment risk. Reinvestment risk is associated with a declining interest rate environment. So you have a bond that pays eight and now it's matured and bonds of similar credit quality, similar maturity pay five. And you say, well, Gene, I've gone accustomed to eight. And I said, well, you can't get eight now. You only get five. A customer annuitizes a variable annuity contract. So remember, that was one of the choices you have, an annuity, which is kind of cool. You can turn it into an income stream uh, that you can't outlive. You know, that's a pretty uh, cool thing to do, pretty uh, bueno, right? Uh, it has an assumed interest rate of 4%. That's called the air. The first check is 225. So I tell my customer that the check is either going to go up or go down or remain the same. So if we get better than four, the check goes up. If we get less than four, the check goes down. If we uh, get the 4%, we leave you alone. So now they say for the check to remain at 225, so it doesn't go up, it goes down. Uh, it doesn't go up, doesn't go down. That means we got the air, the assumed interest rate, which is 4%. Uh, which of the following securities documents are not prepared by a broker dealer? Uh, well, broker dealers do indeed, do indeed prepare research reports. We have a research department and that's what they do. Uh, a prospectus, no, a prospectus is not prepared by a broker dealer. Uh, an ad for the company stock, no. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, we could put an ad and tell you about a research report, so uh, not prepared by broker dealers. So one and three are, you gotta be careful on these. Two and four are not, right? Two and four is a legal document. So we're going to have some law firms uh, working for the issuer to uh, draw that up. So we need two and four. Boom. If a customer fails to pay for security. So, you know, in the secondary market, customers get two additional days to pay for securities. We don't tell them that because we don't want to use our monies and securities to settle a customer trade. Right. But what can the broker dealer do? So you bought, you didn't pay for the buy. We cancel the order. No, you can't do that. I mean, because the customer has bought the stock. The person who the customer bought the stock from doesn't care about that. Find the customer, no. Charge the customer, no. Uh, we're going to sell the securities, right? And charge the customer for any loss. So, but by the way, this is about a mutual fund here. So not a security. So the customer fails to pay for the mutual fund the required amount of time. So, you know, what maybe we did was wire them or front them. I don't know why we would do this. I thought this was about a, a stock trade and it's not. But anyways, it's, uh, the answer is D. A client invests the same amount of money into a mutual fund at regular intervals. Very testable. This is called dollar cost averaging. This is called dollar cost averaging. And three test questions about dollar cost averaging. What makes it work? Fixed dollars invested regularly. What's the end result? You have a lower average cost than those of the underlying shares. And the third test question, it doesn't result in a profit. And so again, what they're asking me here is the result of, so what they're asking is what is the result of dollar cost averaging? 
Now, by the way, that means you've buy, been buying, uh, hopefully you've been buying more shares when they're low and less shares when they're high, which you're supposed to be doing. Uh, the result is a lower return on your cost base? No. The answer is B, that is very testable, right? Three test questions about dollar, whoa, on dollar cost averaging. What makes it work? Fixed dollars invested regularly. What's the end result? You have a lower average cost than those of the underlying shares. That's the choice B. Doesn't guarantee a profit. Doesn't guarantee a profit. Now, when you go to sell those shares, you can use average cost. You can do share identification. But if you can't ad identify the shares you're selling, the IRS is going to pose upon you FIFO. First in, first out. Uh, your customer uh, purchases newly issued 5% preferred stock for 100. Par. After holding position for one year, they sold the uh, shares for 100. So it looks like the only money we made was a result of collecting the 5%, right? So 5% is the uh, fixed or stated rate of return and total return is what you make from the income stream and or price appreciation on the investment. And so it looks like the only thing we made, it was 5%, right? So total return is what you make for plus or minus. This could have been a minus, by the way. If we if we sold it for 95, it would be zero. So total return is plus or minus the price appreciation plus or price depreciation when we sell it, profit or loss, plus the income. So here we got nothing from the security. So all we got was the 5%. Uh, the cost base. So there's two scenarios on the test. Somebody's dead. So, or somebody's alive. Somebody's a living, breathing human being, walking planet Earth or somebody is no longer a living, breathing human being walking planet Earth. And it'll depend on the answer to the question, right? So here it says they have died and you've inherited your chairs. So what happens there is what we call a step up, the step up. So, you know, if I bought a thousand chairs for my nephew, uh, I buy for myself a thousand chairs of Apple 140, and then I die in Apple's uh, 160 and my nephew inherits it, there's a step up in the cost base, which is the value of the stock uh, Uncle Dean dies, which is D. Now, uh, be careful. Be careful. If this is called a step up, this is testable. If this was a gift, if this was a gift, then my nephew would assume my cost base, right? So I'm still alive. I'm still living, breathing human being, walking planet Earth. And I gift the apple to my uh, nephew. His cost base is $140 uh, a share in that example. So be careful. Uh, I would expect you to get one or two of these, either inherited or gift of securities. Investor might expect to receive the greatest gain on an investment in a corporate bond. So remember, when interest rates go down, bond prices go up. When interest rates go down, bond prices go up. Now, be careful. So... This is kind of the opposite of what we practice drill and rehearse most of the time, because most of the time the test is very ne negative in testing on losses. And so the greatest loss you have in investments when interest rates go up would be long and low, the longest term bonds with the lowest maturity. So it would be the opposite when interest rates go down, right? So it's the opposite of what you see more often. So we always are going for long and low, the longest term bonds with the uh, lowest coupon, right? So we're, we're hoping here greatest gain is interest rates are going to go down. So the higher they are, the more they can come down, right? So long-term bonds are always more volatile. So I'm going to say long-term bonds with high interest rates. A customer purchases $50,000 worth of 10% corporate bonds at par. At the end of the day, the bonds close down a half a point. Well, you should know that a bond point is 1% of par, which is $10. So if a bond point is $10, then that means a half a point is $5. Now, the other way you could do that, by the way, is you could take your calculator and you could simply take, I'm just going to put my calculator up here. Uh, you could take one divide by two and then times it by a bond point, which is 10, and you'd get that same $5. So now I got to be careful because I have $50,000 of these, right? 
So I have 50 bonds. So now what I'm going to do is take my 50 bonds, because remember par in a bond is a thousand. So 50,000, unless I'm told differently, is going to be 50 bonds. And so what I'm going to do now is take my 50 times my half a point. So 50 bonds, whoop, 50 bonds times $5. And it looks like that what I'm going to lose there, when I do that math, that's going to equal $250. Um, boom. Boom. Uh, let me uh, clean up my slide here. Uh, I hope you found that helpful. Uh, I've been meaning to put up a practice final. If you're going on to your 63, 65, uh, let me know because I will try and meet you there with another practice exam like this. Uh, I want to make sure I don't blow this submit button because last time I did this, I blew the submit button and uh, I got completely lost. So let's see how we did on this thing. I, I feel pretty good about how we did. Hopefully you did well, right? It's about you. So hopefully you, you know, hit pause, you attempted the answer. Uh, you know, if you want to do this again, you do better than you did the last time. Okay. I'm going to hit submit. Uh, question 41, not answered. This is how I blew it last time. So. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just take the hit on 41 because last time I went back to 41, I wasn't able to, you know, it wiped out the whole thing we did together. I don't want to do that. So uh, whatever I said orally is my answer. And I'm just going to, you know, submit it and submit like I didn't answer 41. Okay, well, that's pretty good. But of course, I'm a senior instructor. So no doubt that Dan Dean should be able to pass the thing. Uh, let's see the one we didn't answer. I think they mark us wrong. So there's one I didn't answer. Let's just go back to that and uh, see what it was. Yeah, I think, okay. So I remember I answered that correctly. I just forgot to hit the button. So, okay, cool. All right. So remember, uh, inch by inch, your series six is a cinch. Yard by yard, your series six is hard. Uh, you also have another practice final from Test Geek in the playlist as well. I haven't finished the explication on the series six playlist, but at least this is a, uh, some more content for you. So uh, put in the comment box, anything you need help on. I respond to comments pretty quickly. And uh, kudos, I'm assuming you already got your SIE testing victory under your belt. So time to go from 1-0 and to 2-0. And, and I'll talk to you uh, the next time we do an explication.